أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم إن زلزلة الساعة شيء عظيم يوم ترونها تذهل كل مرضعة عما أرضعت وتضع كل ذات حمل حملها وترى الناس سكارى وما هم بسكارى ولكن عذاب الله شديد ومن الناس من يجارل في الله بغير علم ويتبع كل شيطان مريد كتب عليه أنه من تولوا فأنه يضله ويهديه إلى عذاب السعير يا أيها الناس إن كنتم في ريب من البعث فإنا خلقناكم من تراب ثم من نطفة ثم من نطفة ثم من علقة ثم من مدغة مخلقة وغير مخلقة لنبين لكم ونقر في الأرحام ما نشاء إلى أجل مسمى ثم نخرجكم طفلا ثم لتبلغوا أشدكم ومنكم من يتوفى ومنكم من يرد إلى الأرض للعمر لكي لا يعلم من بعد علم شيئا وترى الأرض هامدة فإذا أنزلنا عليها فإذا أنزلنا عليها الماء اهتزت وربت وأنبتت من كل زوج بهيج ذلك بأن الله هو الحق وأنه يحيي الموتى وأنه على كل شيء قدير وأن الساعة آتية لا ريب فيها وأن الله يبعث من في القبور ومن الناس من يجادل في الله بغير علم ولا هدى ولا كتاب منير ثاني عتفه ليضل عن سبيل الله لهم في الدنيا خذي ونذيقه يوم القيامة ونذيقه يوم القيامة عذاب الحريق ذلك بما قدمت يداك وأن الله وأن الله ليس بظلام للعبيد صلى الله عليه وسلم So I would like to first begin by introducing our speaker today, Alhamdulillah. We have Dr. Uthman Atif here, Alhamdulillah, from all the way from London, inshallah. So just a brief introduction of the, uh, Dr. Uthman. He has completed his undergraduate studies in um, the Royal Holloway University in Surrey in, in history, subhanAllah. And he went on and completed his master's also in the, on the topic of the Crusaders, Alhamdulillah. And he went even further and did a PhD on that field, mashallah, in, in the same university. Also, he's also the director of Al Hatin Institute, and he's also a khadib in, in one of the measures in uh, one of the measures around there, subhanAllah. And, and he's come here today to give us a talk on the earthquake of the hour, Zazin al Dasa. In our modern times right now, due to our past events, this is a very relevant topic and inshallah we will draw lessons on what has been happening over the past few weeks so that we may learn from it inshallah. So um, without further ado I would like to invite Chef, uh, Dr. Athman to begin the talk inshallah so we can all benefit. Good luck. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. 
الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئة أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله It's a great pleasure to be back with, with all of you uh, once again The topic that we have for discussion today is one of prime importance for all of us. It's one that affects all of us at the very core. It's something of intrinsic importance for every single one of us, every single day of our lives. It's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us about time and time again in the Quran about which our Prophet spoke so much about. And that is the relevance or the proximity of the hour and therefore its relevance for us all the time. The fact that this reality of the sa'a is something that is impending, it's something that is near. But our Prophet ﷺ, he once raised his two fingers and he says, My coming and the last hour are like these two fingers, meaning that the closeness between them is how close we are to the last hour. In one hadith, he says, Al ayat karazat mawlumatun fi silk, fa inakta us silk yakubabatuha wata. And he says that the, the uh, signs before the end of time, those portents and those tokens before the end of time, are like pearls on a string. And when that string is, is cut, then those pearls or those signs follow one after the other. And so we will see them in our times, and we have been seeing them as an ummah since the coming of our Prophet وسلم, and of course they exist even before him but he represents one of those signs and his death was one of those signs as well I want today inshallah to focus to look at it from a different a very new perspective one perhaps that you might not have encountered before a new what might we might call a paradigm shift in our understanding of the end time events and there are about five slides that we will go through but before that, let's try and discuss the relevance of the sa'a uh, from the Qur'an and Hadith literature. In one Hadith, our Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he compared us with the, day, with, uh, the, the first of this Ummah. He said, Inna awwal hadi al-Ummah, ju'ida afitu fi awwaliha, that the, uh, the first of this nation has been given its preservation. And the last of this ummah will have umurun tunkirunaha, will have some affairs that we don't like, will have uh, some fitan, will have some calamities and trials and tests towards the end of time, the last of this nation. Wataji'ul fitna, and a trial or a test will come upon the people, and the believer will get scared and he will say, Hadihi muhlikati, in this trial is my destruction. And then the method kashif, and then it will pass by him, it will leave Wataji'ul Fitna, and another one will come. And then the believer will say, Hadihi, Hadihi, indeed, this one, this one will completely finish me off, and then that one will also leave. And then the Prophet said, Faman Ahabba and Yuzahza and Nar, whoever wants to save himself from the fire and enter paradise, then let his death come to him whilst he believes in Allah and the last day. We know, of course, about the famous narration for the Hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam. That narration when the Prophet was with his companions and this man came along and was wearing very white clothing and had very white beard. And he had no marks or signs of trouble on him. And the companions, they assumed, of course, he must be from a different land because we, they didn't recognize him. And he comes along and he sits by the Prophet and his companions and then he asked the Prophet a question in his Akhbirni and al Islam, tell me about Islam. And the Prophet said Islam is established on five, and he went through the five pillars of Islam. And then that man, he said, Sadaq, you've spoken the truth. And the, and the companions were amazed. Like, how would he know he's spoken the truth? It's as almost as if he knows the answers to his own questions. And then he said, Akhbirni and al Iman, tell me about faith, tell me about Iman. And the Prophet said, you know, Iman is belief in Allah and his angels and the books and, and the day of judgment and the divine decree and the good of thereof and the bad thereof. He went to the six pillars of Iman. And then again the man said, Sadaq, you've spoken the truth. And then he asked him, Akhbirni and al-Ihsan, tell me about Ihsan, right? And the Prophet says, Anta'budullah ka'annaka tarahu wa illa takun tarahu fa'inna wa yaraq. 
worship Allah as though you're seeing Allah. But if you can't know at least Allah is seeing and observing you, meaning of course you can't see Allah, but being that constant awareness, Allah is Raqib, Allah is seeing and watching over you, watching what you do. And then the man again, he said, Sadaq. And then he asked him a fourth question, and he says, Akhbirni an Isa'a, tell me about the last hour. Tell me about the end of time, the last day. And to that the Prophet said, Ma al mas'ul anha bi min as the one who is Ask the question knows no more than the one who is asking the question. Meaning both you and I don't know about the precise detail concerning when that hour will be. And then the man says, well, أَخْبِرْنِي أَنْ أَشْرَاطِيَا Tell me about its signs, about its tokens, about the portents, about those things <coughs> that come before that hour is established. And then the Prophet began to enumerate some of them. And says, إِذَا وَلَدَتِ الْأَمَةُ رَبَّى When you see the slave girl giving birth to her mistress, then you should know that is a sign before the ends of time. إِذَا تَطَاوَلَ رِعَلْ بَهْنِ فِي الْبُنْيَانِ فَذَاكِ مِنْ إِشْرَاطِهَا When you see the nomads and the Bedouins building lofty buildings and towers, and that is a sign before the ends of time. And when you see the Prophet and Urat, and when you see the barefooted, naked herdsmen, uh, becoming the Ra'us and Nas, becoming the leader of people, that is a sign before the end of time. The first line we can see here is one, I can't even see myself. Okay. Uh, we have a hadith from the Prophet. Uh, just before the hour, there will be days in which knowledge will disappear. Right? He spoke about a time. Uh, in many hadith, one hadith. Uh, from Ziyad ibn Labid when he said radiallahu ta'ala and that he was with Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet said there will come a time when knowledge will pass and Ziyad he was confused he says Ya Rasulullah wa kayfu yadhab al-ilm idha nabda al-Quran if we recite the book of Allah and we teach it to our children and then they read the book of Allah the Quran they teach it to their children and it goes on until the end of time how can knowledge leave us and the Prophet said, "Thakulatka ummuki aziyan. May your mother cry over you, O Ziyan. Inni kuntu aradu min afqahi rajulin bil Medina. I thought you were intelligent person in the Medina. He said, "Awalaysa hadi al Yahud wa Nasara. Do you not see the Jews and the Christians? They are reading the Torah and the Injil. They recite from the Torah and the Injil. Wala yamaluna, but they don't act according to what is in those books of theirs. So it is not simply about having the knowledge." It's about acting upon the knowledge. And this is something that is very, very pertinent in the time that we're living in. For those of you, of course, who might have read the works of George Orwell or Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. Of course, in George Orwell's world, 1984, he wrote about a time when he's writing 1930s about a situation in his mind when 1984 comes, you will, you will see that people, that books will be banned or books will be burned, right? and that you will live in a very oppressive and totalitarian society and you will have Big Brother watching over you, you will have CCTV cameras everywhere, you will have this sense of oppression in society. But around the same time in England, in Berkshire by the way, Aldous Huxley wrote another text called Brave New World. He kind of spoke about a different kind of dystopian future and he said no, when that time comes you will be in a situation where you will have so many books, right? The people wouldn't know where to begin or end with those books. You will have so much information. But the truth within that information will be drowned in the sea of irrelevance. You will have so much of everything, like the World Wide Web. Where does it begin? Where does it end? But you will lose the essence. And it's true. If you compare this, for example, to those narrations of those companions who traveled Rahila ila Misr, Traveled from Medina to Egypt, one month's journey. Lihad al Hadith. For one Hadith, Man Zatra al Akhihi fi dunya Zatra Allah wa Alayhi fi al Akhirah. Whoever conceals his brother's sins in this life, Allah conceals his sins in the next life. For one Hadith, they will travel a month's journey because they understood the value and they appreciated the, the, the greatness and the importance of that one Hadith. In another account, a man, he had that hadith, يُحْشَرَ النَّاسُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ حُرْفَاتٌ وَرَاتٌ غُرْلًا People will be resurrected on the Day of Judgment naked and barefoot and uncircumcised. And the, 
the, the man was amazed. Are you sure the Prophet said what a land that people will be uncircumcised? He said, yes, where is the narrator? He's in Egypt. He traveled a month's distance, a month journey. And he inquired, did the Prophet really say Ghurlan? And he said, indeed, he said Ghurlan. Right? Because they understood the value behind this information. Whereas now, of course, we have it at ease. Like, of course, in the days, if you remember, perhaps your fathers will tell you, in the 1980s or I think even the 1990s, you had the Encyclopedia Britannica. Isn't that? And someone who owned a copy of the Encyclopedia Britannica was seen to be, you know, a, a, an honorable, a great person, right? Because he has this wealth, he has a library of information in his home, right? He has encyclopedia. That means he must know about culture and religion and about different countries and this and that. But now, of course, we have Wikipedia on our phones, right? So what has it actually done to the value of ilm, to the value of information and knowledge? Of course, it's diminished, it's reduced. And that is the key, that is the thing. Islam is a religion about the essence. When you think about this narration where this man, Jibreel alayhi salam, by the way, it was Jibreel alayhi salam who came wearing white garments and with uh, of the white bed. When the man left, the Prophet asked Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, do you know who this man was? And he said, Allah and his messenger know best. He says, indeed, this was Jibreel alayhi salam who came to, who came to teach you your religion. Right? But think about that for the third question. Ahbirni and al-Ihsan. Ihsan is the essence. Right? We are not a people of the surface. We are supposed to be a people who are nuanced in our discussions. A people who can see beyond and beneath the outward form. So in this hadith, we find the Prophet Sallallahu just before the hour, there will be days in which knowledge will disappear and ignorance appear. And there will be much killing, right, which we will discuss inshallah in a second. So think about that and think about it in light of the fact that well, we do have knowledge, we do have information. We have more books than we've ever had before. We have more information than we've ever had before. We have more access to information than we've ever had before. But do we really have knowledge? What is knowledge supposed to do? Knowledge is supposed to make us better people. Is it not? Isn't it supposed to make us better human beings and better Muslims and better people? If you take one hadith, you know, Sahaba, they lived with hadith, they lived by hadith. If you take one hadith, when the Prophet advised Abu Dhar al ghifari with seven pieces of advice, O Sadi Khalidi bi Sabah, my intimate friend Khalil, Nabi Sallallahu advised me with seven things. And the first of them was, Anarani bi al Masakin, he commanded me to love the poor. If you simply take this one hadith, like Abu Dhar, because he lived by this hadith, radiallahu ta'ala an, right, that I will, I will make sure I will love the poor. I won't simply say, well, you know, I'm going to give to the poor. I'm gonna... No, you, you really make it a habit in your life that you really and truly love the poor. Think about his second advice, Amarani, and Amr ila man huwa duni wa la Amr ila man huwa fawki. He commanded me to look at those who have less than me and not to those who have more than me. Why do we have a narcissism in our day and age and narcissistic tendencies of self indulgence? Why? How could that be? When we have so much poverty and killing and floods and earthquakes and so much disaster. And it isn't just that, it's televised to every single human being in the world. That means every single person is aware of the plight of another human being. But what effect has it has on us? Because you can imagine in the days of the past where you didn't have television, if someone was suffering in Papua New Guinea, that's his problem, we wouldn't know of it. Right until those uh, memoirs and accounts and diaries you know, reached the shore of England perhaps. But now it's not like that. So what is happening then? Think about the Prophet's words in light of our contemporary situation. Think about the fact that we have so much information, but where is the application of that information? Where is the internalizing of that ilm? Not just having the information, that's something else. And he says you will have so much knowledge. If you look here at the kind of images I selected, Let's start with the one with George Bush and I think the Dalai Lama there, isn't it? It says, ignorance, all right? Uh, see those things, what does that say? Way up there. Those are standards, okay. What are we looking for as human beings? Yesterday or the day before, in fact, I read an article 
uh, where I think her name was Fergie or Fergie, isn't the Duchess of York, I think. I'm happy to be corrected. Uh, but she wrote an article in the paper uh, where she was saying, I'm happy with myself. She said, I'm happy with my body. Basically, that was in fact the, the title of the, of the article, right? And she said, I'm happy with my nails, I'm happy with my hair, I'm happy with my, you know, my looks, I'm happy with my shape, I'm happy with all of this, right? But there was something that was missing in the article that other journalists picked up, like an article I read today from The Independent, where she was satirized and she was mocked. Because what is, what is the essence? Are you happy with your ethics? Isn't it so? Are you happy with your morals? Are you happy with your standard of behavior? Are you happy with the things that really count? Or are you only happy with the artificial and the gloss? If we become a people who are fascinated by the outward, we're simply looking at the aesthetics. We like the gloss. Like in the early days of industrial capitalism, of course, you, will, you had these employers who had these employees, and they were working like 12 to 15 hours a day in factories, right? They gave, the employers gave no real consideration for the leisure activities of these employees. Of course, if they're working that many hours a day, they wouldn't really have time to pursue those leisure activities in the first place. But there were some employers who saw those employees as useful to the capitalists as consumers. If you can turn these workers into consumers, it benefits us and it benefits the whole of society, but at their own detriment, if they're over-consumed in consumption, in consuming. Right? But of course, you can't just have consuming, you have to create the needs. And when you create the needs, then the demands are there for those more needs. So when you see something, are you actually seeing what you want, or are you seeing the image behind what you want? If you're seeing an advert, if you have like an Alfa Romeo, and you want to buy an Alfa Romeo, you will see that Alfa Romeo are driving in a lane in the motorway that you've never seen before. You've never seen the setting ever before. You've never seen even, you've never seen a car by itself driving. You don't see that Alfa Romeo with the other bankers kind of driving behind or in front of it, on the side of it, right? You see it in its most idealized situation. Likewise, if you even had a bar of soap, you will find that bar of soap in a deluxe bathroom. And you think, well, my God, my bathroom doesn't look anything like that bathroom, right? Anything, so it's almost in the, always in the most idealized context. So what, are, what is being sold? It's the image before the product, right? We are fascinated by the way things look. Take a celebrity, for example. We, of course, are living in a day, an age of celebrity culture, right? If you, if you imagine, you know when our prophet said that people would worship idols? He even said that part of his ummah, Right? Hatta ta'bud al asnam until they will worship idols. Right? And they will worship Allah al Uzza, the, the idols of the past. Right? That we will become a people of idolatry. We seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? But there will be people who will worship idols. Right? If you imagine in the days of the Roman Empire, they used to, of course, worship or show fealty as an act of worship to their emperors. But there was about two ways they would do that, right? You would have emperors who were deified, even emperors like Julius Caesar, Augustus was considered to be a god. Julius Caesar was divine filius, he was a son of a god, right? You had emperors like Nero, Marcus Aurelius, people would almost worship them. But one way, of course, was to touch them. That was a transference of divine power in their eyes, to be able to touch the emperor, right? And the other was to own an artifact, own a possession of that emperor, a piece of his tunic or a piece of his bed or something like that. That means you have some kind of transference of divine power. What is it today, right? People stretch their arms out to get a touch of that celebrity or to own something of that celebrity. This is why if you look at that moat in Islam, of course, moat is sa'a. It's the qiyamah of suhra in our religion. It's the lesser hour. It's the smaller hour, right? It's before the sa'at al-kubra. It's before the day of judgment. Every single one of us will have our own qiyamah. And that is something our Prophet was deeply concerned about. He would walk, he once walked by a grave 
and he was walking with his companions and there was another group in the distance and he asked the first group, what are those people over there doing? And they said, Ya Rasulullah, they're digging the grave. He ran ahead of them and he went to that grave and he knelt by the grave and he began to cry. And he said, My dear brothers, for a day like this, prepare yourselves. That was at the heart of the religion of the Prophet and his companions sallallahu They were deeply concerned. What is what has death become in our day and age? And try and understand the earthquake of the hour in light of this. In Hollywood, you have a cemetery, right, called Hollywood Forever, right? It's in LA. It's called Hollywood Forever, and it contains the remains of 135. Um, actors and founders of Hollywood. Someone, Hugh Hefner, in fact, re uh, reserved the crypt next to Marilyn Monroe by paying $85,000, right? $85,000 to reserve a crypt next to the famous actress Marilyn, Marilyn Monroe, right? If you remember when Lee Harvey Oswald assassinated John F. Kennedy, the president of the United States of America, his body was exhumed, I think, in the 1980s, right? Because people were saying it wasn't really him that was interred in that grave. And his body was exhumed. And they interred him in a different, in the same grave, but in a new coffin. Someone bought that old coffin that he was in for around $70,000, right? And he's saying, what is it? What is this fascination people have? The more outlandish you are, the more of a celebrity you become in this day and age. And of course, it's not helped the world by having the introduction of things like YouTube and Facebook. In fact, there is the American Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers, a very big group of lawyers in America, and they said in their research, two-thirds, now contemporary, two-thirds of divorce proceedings they, they cite Facebook as the primary evidence, right? They cite Facebook as the primary evidence in divorce proceedings, right? If you think about the story of Habil and Qabil, hey, you had two brothers, one killed the other one, but the one who was a murderer who killed at least tried to cover up his sin, did he not? He tried to cover up the body of his slain brother, because he still had that sense of humanity in him. This is a wrong I've committed. What about today? With happy slapping, with killing, with indiscriminate murder. In London, just a few days ago, right? These two people were sentenced. Sadly, one was a Muslim. The other one was not a Muslim, right? The one who was not a Muslim took a machine gun. They were both gangsters and they went to another area to find another gang member to kill. And they looked at, and they went and they stopped be, uh, next to a pizza shop. And sadly, a, a girl was in that pizza shop buying pizza and they killed her, right? And then one of those murderers, he said, you should have seen, it was so funny the way she fell, right? What is this loss of humanity? What has it done, right? I mean, I will discuss it, inshallah, later with the slides that I have prepared. So over here you can see on the left hand side, war is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. What does that reflect? A kind of gross inversion of social order, a gross inversion of what is true. The Prophet said one of the signs before the end of time is that the people will believe the liars and disbelieve those who speak the truth. Where you will have an increase in sin, an increase in adultery, an increase in vice, an increase in this. You will have an upturning of social order. And uh, brother, if you could change the slide. Here we have the inversion of social order. I selected this hadith, but I only took some things from this hadith and other things I left because I knew of the time constraints. Here we have a hadith in which our Prophet he said, um, when learning is acquired for other than a religious purpose, right? Again, you lost the essence, right? Learning is acquired for other than a religious, for other than Allah's sake. A man obeys his wife and is unfilial towards his mother, right? He will give his wife uh, an important place, and of course the wife has an, a very important place in Islam, 
But of course, there should be a balance, isn't it, between the wife and the mother. You can never circumvent over the rights and obligations that are due towards your parents uh, for the sake of your wife or your husband for that matter, right? Um, he brings his friends near and drives his father far off, right? And this is something I've even seen in my life, right? That people give more preference uh, to their buddies, to their friends and whatever, over their near kith and kin. Yes, alukan nas. The people they ask, yes, alukan nas. They in the Quran, Allah says, "Mada yunfiqun?" What should they spend their money on? Qul ma anfaqtu min khair fi alwalidayn wa alqarabin, wa aliyatham wa almasakin wa bin sabil, wa ma tafgalu min khair fi Allah bi alim. Right? The people they ask, "What should we spend our money on?" Allah says, "Say, whatever good you spend should be firstly, awalan." For who? Your parents, right? And then your close relatives, Akrabin, well, the Tamad, and the orphans, and the poor, and then the travelers, the wayfarers, and everything of good you spend, our lives aware of it. So we should remember these things. Uh, voices are raised in the mosques, and the most wicked member of a tribe becomes its ruler. The most wicked member of a tribe becomes its ruler. Why do we have the most evil and inhumane people ruling our lands today? Why do we have the most unethical people who have no sense of ethics, no sense of humanity, no sense of even basic insania, and for sure no sense of deen and religion and fear of Allah ruling our lands? They rule by the fist, right? And this is why you have courageous Muslims today who are campaigning against them and who are demonstrating against them. May Allah make that profitable for them. May Allah save us from the bloodshed that, bloodshed that ensues. Think about this. Once in Umar al-Khattab, he was يلعبون, ma, سبياني, his kids were playing on his stomach. You, when you think of Sayyidina Umar, when he was Khalifa, he was of course was a man of brawn. He was big, he was tough. Right, he had this disposition about himself, he was strong, people were scared of the man. And here he is playing, his kids are playing on his stomach. Right? How does that fit with you? And, and one of his wuzara, one of his governors came. He disliked this action of his, right? And by his face, Omar could read the man was, uh, didn't like this action of his, right? And Omar asked him, Right? Then how are you with your family? If I'm doing something that is distasteful in your eyes by my child playing on my stomach, what is the right way to do it? He's asking him. How are you with your family so I can learn from you? He says, Ana, subhanAllah. If I enter my house, no one speaks. Right? Never become like that. Right? If I enter my house, no one can speak. Right? Everyone is hush hush, everyone's scared to speak because of the dad has entered the house. Or the, main, the Lord of the house has entered. How dare anyone, how dare anyone speak? Right? And Omar says to him, you are removed from your position. Right? If you don't have compassion with your family, how can you show compassion to the Ummah of Muhammad? If you don't have this basic compassion in the hadith, Aisha promised to show compassion. Because compassion is not in anything except that it beautifies that thing and is not removed from anything except that it makes ugly and blemished and stained that thing. Right? So we should remember this. And then uh, it says, a man is honored through fear of the evil he may do, right? Honored for fear of the evil he may do. Look at, look at that time for a violent wind and earthquake, right? Being swallowed up by the earth, metamorphosis, pelting rain, and signs following one another like bits of a necklace falling one after the other when a string is cut. And these are signs before the end of time. And these, of course, are human vices that you will expect before that end of time. If you see the images, haste. If you see the images that you have over here, 
This one I found I thought was interesting and interesting for you to see. Whatever you think, think the opposite. Right? Whatever you think, think the opposite. Right? And that, of course, reflects that notion of inversion, isn't it? Whatever you think, think the opposite. Okay, what's the point? Okay, here we have increase in fitan. In this hadith, the Prophet he said that, uh, By him in whose hand is my soul, let that have a dunya. The world will not go. Right. He will pass by a grave and he will say, he will roll in the dust of that grave and he will say, I wish I was in the place of that man in his grave. Right? And it's not because of, I mean, here it says religious reasons, but it's death. It's not because of any debt that he has. Or maybe the the fear that he has to pay back his debt and the fear he has of Allah for Allah because he's paid back the debt but except the increase in calamities right that are coming his way he would wish that he's passed away he, he would wish he's not living and seeing these difficulties and these calamities coming his way and these trials uh, brother if you if you move on <coughs> And here we have something of significance, uh, considering, of course, the earthquake in Japan. And there, of course, have been many earthquakes in our near contemporary history that we should all reflect on. Right? We've seen hundreds of thousands of, of people killed in these earthquakes. In this hadith in Bukhari, the hour will not be established uh, until, of course, earthquakes will be very frequent. Right, you will see a frequency in earthquakes, right, and natural disasters, and it's something for us to reflect on. In the Quran, of course, Allah describes the sa'a as shay'un azim, right? In the zilzal, the sa'a is shay'un azim. Indeed, the earthquake of the sa'a of the last hour is a big shay'un azim. It's a great occurrence. It's a great thing, right? Yom tarawnaha, and so you will see those people, women who will drop their loads and you will see people sukara wa ma'un bi sukara they're drunk but Allah said they look drunk but they're not drunk right in the Quran Allah says yes and it's sa'ah people ask you about the awa right قُلْ إِنَّمَا عِلْمُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّ سَتُ تَكُنُ قَرِيبًا right indeed it's ilm it's knowledge belongs only with Allah Allah knows the exactness of the awa but how would you know? Perhaps the coming of the hour is, 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 is something that is very close to you. In the Quran, Allah says, Right? That the command of the hour is like the blink or the glance of an eye. Or it's closer than that. And indeed, Allah has power over all things. This is something that is very close, a very close occurrence. Allah is closer and closer to mankind comes their reckoning, comes their judgment, but they're in heedlessness. Right? Ghafla is It's wasting your life in unemployment and following your nafs wherever the nafs takes you. Ghafla. Right? And try and understand that in light of dunya. Ismun lihadil. Adil Hayat is the, is the, the name, Dunya, Libodil Akhira Anha, because of its distance from Akhira. Dunya is called Dunya, it's Adana, it's low. Dunya is not a place of prestige, it's a, it's a low realm, it's a low place, and it's far from Akhira. And that's what makes Dunya what Dunya actually is, the world what it is. It's not Alam, right? It's not Alam, like, has connotations of civilization and progress. But dunya is low, right? So we should not make our pursuits entirely dunya focused, right? That is something that is incorrect from our religion. Brother, if you carry on. And here we have something uh, of very important, uh, a very much important. This hadith, I think, is Sahih Muslim, uh, which says that the Prophet of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, said, "Waladi, waladi nasibiyadi." By him in whose hand is my soul. Um, 
الدنيا, the world will not go الناس, until there comes upon the people a day لا يدري القاتل فيما قتل ولا المقتول فيما قتل when the one who kills will not know why he's killing and the one who has been killed will not know why he is being killed now you have two ways of seeing this from the way that I understand that at least there are more perhaps but here we have two that connect to all of us if we start from the picture of the gangsters over there, right? And no disrespect to anyone in that picture. I don't think any of you are in that picture, but you get the point, okay? Here we have the gangster persona, right? What is the gangster persona? If any of you have studied the events of Nazi Germany, if ever you've studied about the Holocaust, or about the concentration camps, or the Warsaw Ghetto, or the uprising, you might have looked at the, of how, it's something I read a lot about, of how the Nazis were able to dehumanize the Jews, depersonalize them. How was it done? How does dehumanization exist between human beings? How are you able to disconnect between, disconnect from other people, right? Lose human affinity. How is that able to happen? One of the ways, of course, there are many ways, right? that they did it, but one of the ways, of course, was to see them not as human beings, and not to give them human descriptions, but to call them items. They were simply cargo. The Jews in concentration camps were not human beings, they were simply items and cargo. And they were even called those kinds of names. One of the first things that they did was to strip them naked. And that, of course, had a psychological dimension to it, because when someone is naked, you don't see them in light of the norm. In a normal human situation, you see people clothed, and clothing give people, gives people humanity. You know, you can see people as human beings. They're unanimal because they're clothed. The moment the clothing is removed, right, in society, bare in front of your face, from one perspective, they become less normal. They become dehumanized, or it's at least a medium to achieve that. And number three, they would have food deprivation, so they would, well, they would become scavengers, right? And so when you see these naked people crawling on all fours looking for food, they, and if you read the accounts in the memoirs of even those who were guilty of those crimes would say things like, we didn't see them as human beings, we saw them as animals, they looked like animals, they were Walk, it was kind of on all fours, scavenging like animals were, right? And she'd remember, of course, the concentration camps were a later development. First, of course, they were working labor, they were working hard, right? You know, doing their jobs. Uh, and then, of course, they were, had summary executions. Now, here we have something interesting. If you stick with a gangster persona for a second, all right? What makes a gangster? What makes someone have a gangster persona, where someone would simply go and kill indiscriminately and not care who he's killing. In, in the 1990s in LA, you had around 25,000 children who took an oath of, to, of, to do or die, which means to kill or to be killed, right? And that is, a, that is a, a gangster oath, to be in a gang. And one of the requirements uh, to enter the gang or prerequisites is they had to go to a different neighborhood Right? And they had to shoot another gangster from a different gang indiscriminately. Right? Children had to do that. It was a form of breaking them. Right? Disconnecting them from the innocence that lies within them. Right? And they would become like gangsters. There's a very, very good book you guys should try and read called Ace for Hop by Barry Sanders. And he speaks a lot about this. The gangster persona in light of the entertainment age. Right? And he has like transcripts from police interviews where um, you know, some gangsters are caught after committing murders and they never use words like murder, by the way, or they never use words like you know, pain or sad or sorry and all these emotive words. They use words like obliterate, terminate, annihilate, exterminate, right? Terminate a kind of vocabulary, all right? Because they're hooked on what? Computer games. He says if you go to any one of their homes, you'll never find a book. You will find computer games, you will find satellite TV, you will find drugs, but you won't find anything to read. Why? Because those are people who are so connected to what? The image. 
and the image becomes more reality to them, the fantasy becomes more real to them than reality itself, right? So they play out, and of course in England, I wrote an article about this by the way, about a, a murder of a, of a boy called Jonathan Matondo, who had a best friend, and the best friend, right, uh, this of course is an insane inversion of course of what friendship stands for, lured him into a, into a, a woods or forest, and said, you know, we're going to meet up with some girls over there, and they both, were, and he was waiting for this boy, Jonathan Matondo, Jonathan Matondo went, and this other individual, you know, had machetes and knives and all kinds of horrific weapons, and he basically skinned his friend alive, and stabbed him to pieces. I mean, he was really hardly, there was anything left of him. And, and then he went, and of course he was caught. He didn't make any effort to clean the blood or anything. This person was addicted to a game called Manhunt, right? You guys might have heard. You see, he would laugh, right? I've never played the game, alhamdulillah, Manhunt, right? But he was addicted to that game. There was a story in America of a child, we're not speaking about adult, a child. A child, man, who's supposed to have some innocence and be protected. Look at the kind of warped transition from childhood to adulthood. Where is the in-between stage? We'll discuss that each other in a second. He went to his parents' bedroom. His parents had banned him from playing the game Grand Theft... No, no. Grand Theft Auto 4, I think it is. <laughs> Grand Theft Auto 4. <laughs> would love, right? Grand Theft Auto 4, right? He would play this game. Then he would have done something bad, so they kind of took it away from him. Not permanently, but just temporarily, whilst he sorts himself out, whatever. He went, he took his dad's gun, he went to his parents' bedroom and he shot them both dead in their beds. Then he went, took a chair and he took the game, then he went to play it. <laughs> yeah. This is sad. This is sad. Okay, if you look from the perspective of human empathy, this is a very, very sad occurrence, right? This is a very sad occurrence. This is not something to, you know, this is a sad occurrence, right? He killed both of his parents. But try and understand the reasons why that is. When the Prophet said, لا يدل القاتل فيما قتل ولا المقتول فيما قتل Do you think his parents could connect with the kind of logic, insane as it is, behind the murderer, behind the child, mommy and daddy, I killed you because I wanted to play the game. Right? لا يدل القاتل فيما قتل ولا المقتول فيما قتل And the one who is killed will not know why he has been killed and the one who is killing will not know why he is killing, right? And this, of course, teaches us a very big lesson about literacy, right? The image should never have prevalence over the written word. What the written word can do is something that the image can never ever do. Why? Because when you're watching the TV, what are you? You are simply a passive recipient. You're allowing these hundred screenshots a minute to pass before you and you have no sense of deliberation, no sense of contemplation or reflection. You're simply taking it all in without no sense of I'm going to take the good and leave the bad. In the Quran, like Allah, the people they say, رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا Right? وَمَانَهُ فِي الْأَرْضِ مِنْ خَلَاقِ The man says, Oh Allah, my Lord, give me from the dunya. Right? You should know, of course, he doesn't ask for hasana, he doesn't ask for the good. He, is, he doesn't know about things like that. He's completely lost. He just, wants, he just wants from dunya, give me as much. He doesn't want to distinguish between the good and the bad. Or give me only the good and leave the bad. But the best are those Allah mentions. They are they who say, رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَا وَقِنَا عَذَابِ النَّارِ my Lord, our Lord, give us the good from this dunya and give us the good from the hereafter and save us from the fire. Those are the ones Allah says will have the best portion right, of goodness. So that's the idea. So on the one hand, you have that gangster persona. In the Quran, of course, we have the remedy. We have the solution. Allah, as we have, if you look at the example of Luqman al-Hakim, in, in Surah Luqman, in his advice to his son, uh, don't turn your cheek away from people in pride, right? And don't walk on the earth with insolence. Allah does not love any arrogant boaster. The poet said, Don't walk on the earth except with humility because how many people underneath the earth 
are higher than you. فَإِنْ كُنْتَ فِي خَيْرٍ وَإِذْ إِذْ 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 not the kind of gangster persona where they think they can control or own everything, right? They see the world as polarized, there's only us and them, right? There's me and my homies and them, the enemies. This is the language that they use, not my language, right? So no one should kind of quote me on that, but this is their language, all right? If you look on the left-hand side, something, something even more grotesquely worrying for us. Here you have a scene from Gaza, right? May Allah help and give victory and honor to the Muslims of Gaza. They're our brothers and sisters. May Allah make us of those who work to defend them. May Allah destroy their enemies and our enemies at the same time. Here we have a scene from Gaza, right? You have a man carrying a child, okay? You have a man carrying a child. And of course, there were thousands and hundreds of kids who were killed in that onslaught in 2008. But throughout the years, of course, have been so many scenes like this that we've seen. Now here you have a correlation between what we call altitude and attitude. Altitude, of course, is the higher up that you are, right? One of the reasons why the gas chambers were introduced in the Holocaust is because is to disconnect people from human suffering. If you'll see, they would, of course, they had summary executions. They would line up these individuals and they would shoot them dead, okay? You're seeing the, the, the carnage, you're seeing the blood, you know, you're seeing the people scared to die. You know, if you read the accounts, they're horrific. People would you know, throw their hands up in their air, people would beg for clemency, people would beg for mercy. What does that do to the human being and his in a disposition, what does that do to his mental psyche when he's seeing someone begging for his life, but you take a gun and point blank range and you kill them? What does that do? And the person is innocent. He doesn't deserve whatever you're meeting out to him, right? Of course, the one who is doing that is going to affect him. Hitler couldn't have that kind of weak, right, in inverted commas, person in his, in his kind of, uh, you know, in his, in his army. Right? He needed to strengthen them up. And even if you look at it from a different perspective, he would make them, the officers, go through their own kind of hardening up rituals where they had to travel miles with heavy luggage and heavy bags. And that was seen as a form of hardening these soldiers up to prepare them for the crimes that they would eventually commit. It was all a process. Right? So he had this twisted conception and people were, you know, collectively uh, brainwashed into following this, right? Now, the reason why they introduced the execution chambers is to, is to, you let the machine do the job of the human. Let the machine do it. The machine won't have human empathy, but the human being will, right? So if you simply stick them in the back of a truck and they're going to be gassed, asphyxiated, they're going to, they're going to be gassed, they're going to suffocate. The machine will do that, not you. So therefore, you leave without, you know, it's a blasé attitude, it's a matter-of-fact approach. You won't have the human connection. How does that connect to this picture over here? If a fighter jet, right, if someone's flying a fighter jet and he's flying it over and he presses a button, that button drops a bomb, that bomb drops on an innocent people, a village, and it kills a hundred or a thousand, whatever people, or even 20, 30 people, right? That person has lost his connection. He's completely disconnected. His altitude hasn't allowed him to see the decimated remains, right, of those victimized and, and slaughtered human beings, right? He doesn't connect to that. But if one of those soldiers in those planes was to go down to one person and take a gun and kill the one person in point blank range, that is more difficult for him to do. It is easier for him to drop a bomb, a bomb from the altitude than it is for him, than it is for him to uh, kill a person in point blank range. And that is the connection between altitude 
and the attitudes that we formulate in our minds, right? We should never become a people like that, right? But this is how they are. And it's even, if you look at punishments, the one who drops a bomb is less punished, if he's ever caught to be punished, than the one who in point blank range will kill, will kill a person, right? This individual who in London killed that girl, he was he sentenced to 35 years in prison. And as was his accomplice, 35 years in prison because he took out a machine gun, he sprayed it, and he shot this girl in the neck and she died, right? And they were out looking for some gangsters. You know, 35 years in prison. But those who did that won't get anything, anytime, right? And of course, we should remember the hadith, right, of our Prophet ﷺ when he said, Inna Allah, Allah sometimes gives respite, gives time to the qalim, to the oppressor. But when Allah seizes him, he never lets go of him, right? And you know, may Allah deal with those who inflict those crimes against Muslims, against our brothers and sisters. We must show immense connection with them and work to help them and assist them and support them. And, you know, uh, look, there are, you know, you have so many now in Gaza and all over the world you have orphans. You know, we have, we have orphans. And there was a time, of course, where people used to speak about orphans and you think, you know, there must be orphans in the world. But now it's like, everyone knows there are orphans everywhere. How could you help them? <coughs> Groups like Umar Welfare Trust and others in Interpal have some very good programs to help <coughs> the orphans. Like 15, 20 pounds a month, people can afford that, right? To assist an orphan, right? Imagine the hadith that says that the one who helps the orphan is like this with me in Jannah. Like this, like these two fingers, right? Because you look after an orphan, right? So we should of course help them. But that is, that is important, understanding the idea of indiscriminate killing. On the one hand, we have the creation of a persona that facilitates the killing, right? Or the culture of the killing, the culture of killing. And on the other hand, you have the indiscriminate killing because of the complete disconnect from human beings. The altitude and the attitude. Uh, there is more to be said, a lot more, inshallah, but I think we have to break the Maghrib now, inshallah. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, accept from us and forgive us and have mercy upon, upon all of us.